right, turn to page 266 with me, and we are going to finish the book and figure out what happened to TJ and his family. When the dawn came peeping yellow-gray and stood over the horizon, the fire was out and the thunderstorm had shifted eastward after an hour of heavy rain. I stood up stiffly, my eyes tearing from the acrid smoke, and looked out across the cotton to the slope, barely visible in the smoggish dawn. Near the slope where once cotton stalks had stood, their brown bowls popping with tiny puffs of cotton, the land was charred, desolate, black, still steaming from the night. I wanted to go and take a closer look, but for once, Christopher John would not budge. No, he repeated over and over, I ain't going. But what Mama meant was that she didn't want us near the fire, and it's out now. Christopher John set his lips firmly together, folded his plump arms across his chest, and was adamant. When I saw that he would not be persuaded, I gazed again at the field and decided that I could not wait any longer. Okay, you stay here then. We'll be right back. Ignoring his protest, Little Man and I ran down to the wet road. He really ain't coming, said Little Man, amazed, looking back over his shoulder. I guess not, I said, searching for signs of the fire and the cotton. Farther up the road, the stalks were singed and the fine gray ash of the fire lay thick upon them and the road and the forest and trees. When we reached the burnt-out section of the field, we surveyed the destruction. As far as we could see, the fire line had extended midway up the slope, but it had been stopped at the trench. The old oak was untouched. Moving across the field slowly and mechanically, as if sleepwalking, was a flood of men and women dumping shovels of dirt on fire patches, which refused to die. They wore wide handkerchiefs over their faces, and many wore hats, making it difficult to identify who was who. But it was obvious that the ranks of the firefighter, firefighters had swelled from the two dozen townsmen to include nearby farmers. I recognized Mr. Lanier by his floppy blue hat working side by side with Mr. Sims, each oblivious of the other, and Papa near the slope waving orders to two of the townsmen. Mr. Granger, hammering down smoldering stocks with the flat of a shovel, was near the south pasture where Mr. Morrison and Mama were swatting the burning ground. Nearer, the fence... Nearer the fence, a stocky man, masked like the others, searched the field in robot fashion for hidden fire under the charred skeletons of broken stalks. When he reached the fence, he leaned tiredly against it, taking off his handkerchief to wipe the sweat and soot from his face. He coughed and looked around blankly. His eyes fell on little man and me staring up at him. But Caleb Wallace seemed not to recognize us, and after a moment he picked up his shovel and started back toward the slope without a word. Little man nudged me. Look over there, Cassie. There go Mama and Big Ma. I followed his pointing finger. Mama and Big Ma were headed home across the field. Come on, I said, sprinting back up the road. When we reached the house, we dragged our feet across the wet lawn to clean them and rejoined Christopher John on the porch. He looked a bit frightened sitting there all alone and was obviously glad we were back. Y'all all right, he asked. Of course we're all right, I said, plopping on the porch and trying to catch my breath. What'd it look like? Before either Little Man or I could answer, Mama and Big Ma emerged from the field with Stacy, the sacks now black and remnants in their hands. We ran to them eagerly. Stacy, you all right? I cried. What about TJ? Aunt C- Claude, stammered Christopher John. And Little Man asked, Papa and Mr. Morrison, ain't they coming? Mama held up her hand wearily. Babies, babies. And she put her arm around Christopher John. Claude's fine, honey. And... She said, looking down at Little Man, Papa and Mr. Morrison, they'll be coming soon. But TJ, Mama, I persisted, what about TJ? Mama sighed and sat down on the steps, laying the sacks on the ground. The boys and I sat beside her. I'm going to go on in and change, Mary, Big Ma said, climbing the steps and opening our bedroom door. Miss Fanny going to need somebody. Mama nodded. Tell her I'll be down soon as I get the children to bed and things straightened out here. Then she turned and looked down at Little Man, Christopher John, and me, eager to know what had happened. She smiled slightly, but there was no happiness in it. TJ's all right. The sheriff and Mr. Jameson took him into Strawberry. But why, Mama? asked Little Man. He done something bad? They think he did, baby. They think he did. Then, then they didn't hurt him no more, I asked. Stacy looked across at Mama to see if she intended to answer. Then, his voice hollow and strained, he said, Mr. Granger stopped them and sent them up to fight the fire. I sensed that there was more, but before I could ask what, Christopher John piped, And, and Papa and Mr. Morrison, they didn't have to fight them all men. They didn't have to use the guns. 
Thank the Lord, no, said Mama. They didn't. The fire come up, said Stacy. And Mr. Morrison come and got me. And then them men come down here to fight the fire and didn't nobody have to fight nobody. Mr. Morrison come get you alone, I asked, puzzled. Where was Papa? Stacy again looked at Mama and for a moment they were both silent. Then Stacy said, we all know he couldn't make that slope with that bad leg of his. I looked at him suspiciously. I had seen Papa move on that leg. He could have made the slope if he wanted to. <sniffs> all right now, Mama said, rising. It's been a long, tiring night, and it's time you all were in bed. I reached for her arm. Mama, how bad is it really? I mean, is there enough cotton left to pay the taxes? Mama looked at me oddly. Since when did you start worrying about taxes? I shrugged, then leaned closer toward her, wanting an answer, yet afraid to hear it. The taxes will get paid, don't you worry, was all the answer she gave. Now let's get to bed. But I want to wait for Papa and Mr. Morrison, protested little man. Me too, yawned Christopher John. Inside. All of us went in but Stacy, and Mom did not make him. But as soon as she had disappeared into the boys' room to make sure little man and Christopher John got to bed, I returned to the porch and sat beside him. I thought you went to bed, he said. I want to know what happened over there. I told you, Mr. Granger, I come and got Mama and Mr. Morrison like you asked, I reminded him. Now I want to know everything happened after I left. Stacy sighed and rubbed his left temple absently, as if his head were hurting. Ain't much happened, except that Mr. Jameson tried talking to them men some more, and after a bit, they pushed him out the way and stuffed TJ into one of their cars. But Mr. Jameson, he jumped into his car and lit out ahead of them and drove up to Mr. Granger's and swung his car smack across the road so couldn't nobody get past him. Then he starts laying on his horn. You go over there? He nodded. By the time I got across the field to where I could hear what was going on, Mr. Granger was standing on his porch and Mr. Jameson was telling him that the sheriff or nobody else was about to stop a hanging on that flimsy message he'd sent up to the Averys. But Mr. Granger, he just stood there on his porch looking sleepy and bored. And finally he told the sheriff, Hank, you take care of this. That's what folks elected you for. Then Caleb Boss, he leaps out of his car and tries to grab Mr. Jameson's keys. But Mr. Jameson threw them keys right into Mr. Granger's flower bed and couldn't nobody find them. So Melvin and R.W. come up and pushed Mr. Jameson's car off the road. Then them cars was about to take off again when Mr. Granger comes running off the porch, hollering like he's lost his mind. There's smoke coming from my forest yonder, he yells. Dry as that timber is, a fire catch hold, it won't stop burning for a week. Give that boy away like he wants and get up on there. And folks started running all over the place for shovels and things. And then all of them cut back down the road to the Avery's and threw them woods over to our place. And that's when Mr. Morrison come got you? Stacy nodded. He found me when I followed them men back up to the woods. I sat very still listening to the soft sounds of the early morning, my eyes on the field. There was something which I still did not understand. Stacy nodded toward the road. Here come Papa and Mr. Morrison. They were walking with slow, exhausted steps toward the drive. The two of us ran down the lawn, but before we reached the car, before we reached the road, a car approached and stopped directly behind them. Mr. Jameson was driving. Stacy and I stood curiously on the lawn, far enough away not to be noticed, but close enough to hear. David, I thought you should know, said Mr. Jameson. I just come from Strawberry to see the Averys. How bad is it? Mr. Jameson stared straight out at the road. Jim Lee Barnett, he died at four o'clock this morning. Papa hit the roof of the car hard with his clenched fist and turned toward the field, his head bowed. For a long, long minute, none of the men spoke. Then Mr. Morrison said softly, The boy, how is he? Doc Crandon said he's got a couple of broken ribs and his jaw's broken, but he'll be all right for now. I'm going to his folks to tell them and take them to town. Just thought I'd tell you first. Papa said, I'll go in with them. Mr. Jameson pulled off his hat and ran his fingers through his hair, damp against his forehead. Then squinting, he looked over his shoulder at the field. Folks thinking, he said slowly, as if he did not want to say what he was about to say. Folks thinking that lightning struck that fence of yours and started a fire. He pulled out his ear. It's better, I think, that you stay clear of this whole thing now, David, and don't give anybody cause to think about you at all, except that you got what was coming to you by losing a quarter of your cotton. There was a cautious silence as he gazed up at Papa and Mr. Morrison, their faces set in grim, tired lines. 
or somebody might just get to wondering about that fire. Stacy, I whispered, what's he talking about? Hush, Cassie, Stacy said, his eyes intent on the men. But I want to know. Stacy looked around at me sharply, his face drawn, his eyes anxious. And without even a murmur from him, I suddenly did know. I knew why Mr. Morrison had come for him alone, why Mr. Jameson was afraid for Papa to go into town. Papa had found a way, as Mama had asked, to make Mr. Granger stop the hanging. He had started the fire. And it came to me that this was one of those known and unknown things, something never to be spoken, not even to each other. I glanced at Stacy, and he saw in my eyes that I knew, and understood the meaning of what I knew, and he said simply, Mr. Jameson's going now. Mr. Jameson turned around in the driveway and headed back toward the Avery's. Papa and Mr. Morrison watched him leave. Then Mr. Morrison walked silently up the drive to do the morning chores. And Papa, noticing us for the first time, stared down at us, his eyes bloodshot and unsmiling. I thought you would have been in bed by now, he said. Papa, Stacy whispered hoarsely, what's going to happen to TJ now? Papa looked out at the climbing sun, a round red shadow behind the smog of sheet. He didn't answer immediately, and it seemed as if he were debating whether or not he should. Finally, very slowly, he looked down, first at me, then at Stacy. He said quietly, He's in jail right now. And, and what then? asked Stacy. Papa studied us. He could possibly go on the chain gang. Papa, could he? Could he die? asked Stacy, hardly breathing. Son, Papa, could he? Papa put a strong hand on each of us and watched us closely. I ain't never lied to y'all. Y'all know that. Yes, sir. He waited, his eyes on us. Well, I... I wish I could lie to y'all now. No, oh, Papa, no, I cried. They wouldn't do that to old TJ. He can talk his way out of just about anything. Besides, he ain't done nothing that bad. It was them senses. Tell them that. Stacy, shaking his head, backed away, silent, not wanting to believe, but believing still. His eyes filled with heavy tears, then he turned and fled down the lawn and across the road into the shelter of the forest. Papa stared after him, holding me tightly to him. Oh, Papa, do, does it have to be? Papa tilted my chin and gazed softly down at me. All I can say, Cassie girl, is that it shouldn't be. Then, glancing back toward the forest, he took my hand and led me to the house. Mama was waiting for us as we climbed the steps, her face wan and strained. Little Man and Christopher John were already in bed, and after Mama had felt my forehead and asked if I was all right, she sent me to bed, too. Big Ma had already gone to the Avery's, and I climbed into bed alone. A few minutes later, both Mama and Papa came to tuck me in, talking softly in fragile, gentle words that seemed about to break. Their presence softened the hurt, and I did not cry. But after they left and I saw Papa through the open window disappear into the forest after Stacy, the tears began to run fast and heavy down my cheeks. In the afternoon when I awakened, or tomorrow or the next day, the boys and I would still be free to run the red road, to wander through the old forest and sprawl lazily on the banks of the pond. Come October, we would trudge to school as always, barefooted and grumbling, fighting the dust and the mud in the Jefferson Davis school bus. But TJ never would again. I had never liked TJ, but he had always been there, a part of me, a part of my life, just like the mud and the rain, and I had always thought that he always would be, yet the mud and the rain and the dust would all pass. I knew and understood that. What had happened to TJ in the night I did not understand, but I knew that it would not pass, and I cried for those things which had happened in the night and would not pass. I cried for TJ, for TJ and the land.